Good evening. My name is Dr. Denise Jones, or Dr. D as I'm known here at Trinity, and I'm privileged to serve as Vice President for Academic Affairs. On behalf of this academic enterprise, it is my great honor to welcome you. And I thank you for joining us online tonight for this year's Reading Together Lecture, featuring acclaimed artist and author, T. Wee. I also think it's important for you to know that this series is made possible by the generous donations from the late General Albert de Corsi and Mrs. Esther de Corsi of San Antonio. We are grateful for their support and their vision for what this series would mean for this institution. Regarding our speaker's book discussion for this evening, like all great books, Ms. Bui's writings bridges the divides that are sometimes created by time and space. It gives access to people, their cultures, and the many inclusive ways of thinking that transcend who we are and the experiences we might have had as individuals. The book shows us Southeast Asia and California, but more than that, it can help us to understand as well the joys and fears of those as far away as Belarus or right here in San Antonio. Later, you will have an opportunity to participate in an interactive discussion with Ms. Bui. Introducing our speaker is Trinity student Lily Dang, a junior neuroscience major from Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's president of the Trinity University Vietnamese Student Association. Lily, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Dr. D. <laughs> Greetings, Trinity readers. My name is Lily Dang, and I'm delighted to introduce T. Hui. T. Hui was born in Vietnam and came to the United States in 1978 as part of the so-called Boat People Wave of refugees fleeing Southeast Asia at the end of the Vietnam War. Her debut graphic memoir, The Best We Could Do, has been selected for an American Book Award. An All City, read by Seattle and San Francisco Public Libraries, a National Book Critics Circle finalist in autobiography, an Eisner Award finalist in reality-based comics, and now the Reading Together program. She illustrates the picture book, A Different Pawn, written by poet Bao Phi, for which she won a Calcutta honor. With her son, Hien, she co-illustrated the children's book, Chicken of the Sea, written by Pulitzer winner Viet Thanh Nguyen and his son, Ellison. Her short comics can be found online at The Nib, Pan America, and Boom California. She is re currently researching and drawing a work of graphic nonfiction about immigrants' detention and deportation to be published by Random House. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you T. Wee performing her remarkable book, The Best We Could Do. Thank you so much, Lily, Dr. D. A refugee camp is a bottleneck of people seeking a new home. In March of 1978, when we arrived at Pulau Bazar, there were already 3,000 people in the camp. Every week, a delegation came from a different country. France, Canada, Australia, the US. To interview people wanting to resettle there. We'll go to France. We speak the language. Who do we know there, though? Any choice was a gamble. My parents decided our future is on very little information. You already have two sisters in America, and we know a little English. Maybe we could teach French in America. For children, camp was in many ways a wonderful vacation. No school. Let's watch the ladies dive for shellfish. Wanna ride on my back? Yeah. Gonna practice floating. An escape from regular life. Bic, from Aurora School, is that you? Vu, what are you doing here? 
And why are you still wearing our old school uniform? My family just arrived. They didn't tell me where we were going. They just picked me up from school one day. And now I'm here. Can I have a little privacy, please? For Ma, there was the worry of how to have and care for a newborn baby in a refugee camp. You speak wonderful French, madame. Surely someone like you has other resources. Ma was so humiliated by having to beg and so upset at having her honesty questioned. She went into labor that evening. And still no diapers. Hold on, hey. sis. <clears throat> wow. Ah. The struggle to bring a life into the world is rewarded by that cry. It is a single-minded effort, uncluttered and clear in its objective. What follows afterward, that is, the rest of the child's life, is another story. Daily life was not easy. Water came out of ditches dug by previous residents and had to be boiled before drinking. Wood for boiling and cooking had to be gathered from the dwindling forest surrounding the camp. There were no proper toilets. Bo would take us a little further out each day to relieve ourselves and bring back firewood. Yet we were among the lucky ones. Our stay there was only a few months. That's us! On the other side of the world, Ma's older sister Dao and her husband acted as our U.S. sponsors and processed all of our paperwork quickly. The Red Cross helped us get our plane tickets, and my parents promised to repay them once they had jobs. In Kuala Lumpur, we got our immunizations and our health cleared. Ah! Ow! Ouch! <laughs> all except for Bo. There were scars in your lung x-ray. You need to stay so we can take a closer look. How long? My family leaves tomorrow. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. They said their goodbyes at the church where we slept. I borrowed $30 from an old student back at camp. I used some of it to buy new outfits for the kids. We don't need much else. Take this for your trip. And then the next morning... Does anyone here speak English? A little. That's great. We need you two to help this group get to where they're going. But I have four children. Don't worry. My wife and I can watch your kids. There were about a hundred people who needed Ma to show them to their gates, help them check in, and fill out forms. We sat with the elderly couple, absorbed by the Hershey bar that Ma had bought for us. Finally... It's time for us to get on the plane. The flight attendant gave Ma a bassinet for the baby, but he cried every time she tried to put him down. She had only one cloth diaper for him, so every time he peed, she dried him with napkins and folded the cloth to move the wet spots. Just don't poop, okay? My sisters and I got an airplane pin and juice, which kept us content. Then the chaos of getting in and out of Los Angeles. Customs, baggage, connecting, flights. You go to gate seven, over there. Hurry, they're calling your flight. You go to terminal three, follow the signs. Wait, which way did you say, miss? No, please, miss, take us there. We're scared we'll get lost. After helping everyone else, Ma realized, oh no, our flight's about to leave. Finally, on June 28, 1978, we arrived at Chicago O'Hare Airport. Ma's sister Dow and one of her daughters were there to meet us. Welcome to America! Meanwhile, back in Kuala Lumpur... You have scars from tuberculosis, but no infection. You are cleared to go. Kuala Lumpur Airport? Like Ma, Bo was called upon to use his limited English to help the other refugees traveling. Listen, there's been an airline strike. We had to get you all new tickets. In Los Angeles, distracted by the needs of others, Bo actually did miss his own flight. No, what do I do? Through broken English, a lot of gesturing, and eventually a supervisor who spoke French, Bo got on a late flight to Anchorage, Alaska. He spent his first night in America on a bench in the airport. 
Bose attempts to call Ma's sister on a payphone were unsuccessful. His experience in Los Angeles left him too nervous to leave his waiting area to go buy food. When he finally arrived at Chicago O'Hare Airport, his belly was as empty as his morale was low. Excuse me, are you from Vietnam? Yes. Tom Rivers from the U.S. Catholic Charities. I come out here every day to see if there's any refugees arriving. Where are you going? Unbelievable. I know that man. I go to South every day for a bowl of pho. Why is it so ugly? Ha ha ha! You don't like it? Hammond, Indiana. Two hours later. Surprise. Oh my god. That night we slept reunited under the same roof in a new country. Me, my baby brother, Bo and Ma and Lan and Bake in a two-bedroom house with my aunt, her husband, their five children and one dog. And now I'll give you the epilogue out of order in San Diego, California, one year later. Was Bo so terrible? It's hard to remember. My memories of him live in an orange apartment building in San Diego, California. I remember blinding concrete and the rectilinear shapes of lawns and parking lots. Bottle brush and cypress these stairs and the claustrophobic darkness inside our home. I remember streets named after states and schools named after presidents and imagine each block each day turned us a little more American. The same month we moved into the orange apartment building, a 16 year old girl in San Diego aimed her rifle at the elementary school children across the street from her house, killing two people and injuring nine. The mayor at the time was Pete Wilson, the same California governor I would hate many years later for backing one of the most anti-immigrant laws in history. San Diego was a naval and marine corps base where the wounds of the Vietnam War were still fresh and not everyone welcomed our presence. I learned about America mostly through books and TV and from what my sisters learned in school. Every morning we have to say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. One nation, under God, indivisible. And as though this induction into Americanhood needed any more nudging. You stupid gook. There were reasons to not want to be anything other. For my parents, already fully formed in another time and place to which they could never go back, home became the holding pen for the frustrations and the unexercised demons that had nowhere to go in America's finest city. Good evening, everybody. I'm so delighted that you're able to join us for this Reading Together event. My name is Michael Soto. I'm Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs and Professor of English at Trinity. And on behalf of the entire Reading Together Selection Committee, we're really excited that you're here to join us for this interactive conversation with the amazing writer and artist, T. Bui. In just a moment, we're gonna hear from some students who have questions for T. And then we're gonna hand things off to you. So if you have questions, you can find this broadcast on the Trinity Facebook page. 
leave a question in the comment section. You can go to the YouTube channel, leave a comment in the, in the, section, the comment section there. And we're looking forward to some lively interaction. Now, I am very pleased to introduce our first student questioner, Angelina Salazar, who is joining Trinity this year as a first year from San Benito, Texas. Angelina, take it away. Hello, yes. Um, my question was uh, for TV. Uh, I was wondering, in your novel, you mentioned believing that the past of your parents can run through you or essentially you can be a product of your parents past and i was wondering how much if so do you believe that has that contributed to your success as an author first of all hello thank you for your question thanks for having me everyone at trinity um, I owe everything to my parents, really, I, and I don't mean to just generalize gratitude, but I really do owe them everything. Um, it is their story, uh, and they let me tell it, which was a very, very scary thing if you think about it. Um, I don't know if I would trust them to tell my story. <laughs> um, and I snuck in a lot of quality time with my parents, um, getting their stories down and trying to do it in a way that um, honored them as whole human beings. And that meant telling some of their warts as well as their um, amazingness. Um, so yeah, the book is the book is theirs as well as mine. I really, I owe them everything. Thank you, T. Once again, everyone, if you're watching a slide, shoot your questions online on Facebook or YouTube, and we're happy to put you in contact with our guest tonight. Our next question is coming from another first year student, Joseph Herlin, who is joining the Trinity community from Fort Worth, Texas. Joseph. Hello, Ms. Bui, and hello, everyone. Um, one of the major themes that I took away from your book was uh, the quest for identity, both your quest for your own identity and your discoverance of your parents' identities. So there are tons of people in the world and in our Trinity community who struggle with their identity. Do you believe that an evaluation of the journeys of those who raised us and shaped us is a helpful tool to anyone who wishes to have a more complete understanding of who they are? I do. Um, I think empathy is a really important thing to develop at any age, but especially when you are a young adult um, leaving your parents home for the first time, um, exposing yourself to new ideas, new people, new places, um, forging your own life. It's a really important tool to have in your, in, in your tool belt. Um, empathy, empathy eases that transition and it helps you learn um, along the way rather than like build more walls around yourself along the way, right? And I think like one of the earliest things that we can learn is to um, see our parents, not as our parents, but as real people um, who, who were people with hopes and dreams before they had us. Um, so I guess, you know, they say in writing, when you start out, write, write what you know. And I, I literally did that. Um, I wrote about the people that I knew, but I learned that I didn't actually know them that well. Um, and so that was my first my first foray into adulthood was actually just learning how much I didn't know about my parents and um, learning to be humble uh, about how hard it is to be a parent. Um, as I became a parent myself, that lesson really hammered home. Thanks. And nice to see you again from this afternoon. Thank you, Twee. Our next question comes from first year student Rafaela Martinez, who is joining us this evening. She's joining Trinity from Quito, Ecuador. Rafaela. Hi, Tibui. First of all, I feel very honored to be here in your presence tonight. I have been in a couple of sem seminars with you, and I am always glad to hear all of your wisdom. Um, my question is, 
Many authors choose to write works of fiction because it transports them to another reality, far away from the hardship of their daily lives and memories. You, on the other hand, decided to embrace your past and instead of hiding it from society, you pushed it into the light. What inspired you to dive into your family history and motivated you to be vulnerable enough to tell this story to an audience? Mm, thank you so much. And it's also really nice to see you again. Um, hmm. I think I just have a nonfiction brain, you know, um, I, I double majored in college, I did political science and art, and then I wanted to get more specific in political science, so I went into legal studies, thinking I'd one day become a civil rights lawyer. Um, so my brain is just very much in the social sciences, but my expression um, is a little bit different because I've got this weird other side of me that needs, needs to play. Um, so I, I suppose in a way, researching lets me transport myself to other places because I didn't grow up in Vietnam. It was, a, it was, like, a, it was like that picture that I drew with like a hole in my heart, the shape of Vietnam. There was this yearning for a place that was part of me, but I didn't know. And so um, learning about it through my parents' stories and reading and researching was a way to transport myself to a place that I dreamed about. It just happened to be more rooted in the real world than maybe some fictional worlds that other writers create. Thank you. Now, once again, folks, you can ask questions online on Facebook and YouTube. And as those come in, I have a couple of questions myself. Um, and I want to first take us back to um, your video, which was a really compelling performance of a text that um, isn't animated, but your actors and the music brought it to life. What, what made you choose that particular uh, part of the best we could do to, to perform in that way? Um, thank you. Um, there are two scenes that I usually do, and it has to do with what I think will read well on the stage. Um, the other one that I share with people is about um, is about politics more, and um, it depends on like what's happening in the world. Whether I want to talk more specifically about the refugee experience, like the the literal refugee experience, like going to a camp and then getting resettled, um, and that you know is a perennial issue, but it has come up again recently. And so I just wanted to put that in, out on the table as something we might talk about. So I I think about 1978 when most Americans. Um, were afraid of, of letting in so many refugees from Southeast Asia. The majority of Americans um, did not want us at the time. And in California, the, the governor at the time was Jerry Brown, who was in his first year of his first term um, and said that, um, you know, the economy wasn't good and it wasn't a good idea. Um, and he was wrong. He turned out to be wrong. And then he changed his policies later towards um, more recent refugees from Syria. Um, but it is it isn't a perennial issue for America, um, and it's a story that I have like a particular insight into and can share the experience of being on that side. Um, now that I'm now that I'm lucky to be on the side of like people who are citizens who vote and can affect policy, I like to bring that old story up. Thanks. You know, I'm an um, an American literature scholar, and so as I was. Um, discussing your book with my students, they were quick to come to the realization that the immigration story, the refugee story, really is the American story. And so they were able to relate to it in that cultural historical sense. But I think they can also relate to it um, as new students in college and new members of the Trinity community because they've just embarked on a personal journey. They find themselves surrounded by a new environment and, and making new friends. Um, what advice would you have for our new students in particular? They all got a copy of your book. Um, what advice would you have for them as they try and put down roots in this new home away from home? Hmm. Um, it's a really special period of, of your life, right? Like that 
I don't know if you get it again, that it, it's a combination of like that age in your life developmentally and just the fact that there's an institution there that's created for your learning and growth. Um, that's an incredible thing. Not many of us are lucky enough to have that experience later on. So make the most of it, like join all the clubs, you know, like go to all the classes, um, go to the extra classes, use the library, use um, the gym. Oh my gosh, the gym. Um, you know, like when I walked around UC Berkeley's campus when I was an undergrad, I just felt so rich, you know, like all these buildings that were so beautiful and old and these lawns and trees were mine too. You know, they were shared by 30,000 other students, but I felt rich because I got to call them mine for a time. That's a really special thing. And even um, if you don't get to be on campus this semester, I hope you do before the year ends. Um, and I'm sure that the, the university is working super hard to make a lot of the resources available, available to you in some other creative way, make the most of it. Thanks. So we have some questions coming in online and let's take one of those and then we'll hand things back to Rafaela. But first the online question. This is from Macy Frazier. Did your siblings share the same fear of passing on the genes of sorrow as you did? I think so. My oldest sister um, had resolved to not ever have children. Um, she, uh, she had a momentary lapse. Uh, she called it her optimistic lapse when, when I became pregnant with my son. And so she decided to have one child as well. But um, before that, she didn't think that the world was a, a place that she wanted to bring children into. Um, my brother, of course, like has two, children but he he of course like watches them very carefully and watches himself very carefully for fear of like finding patterns from how we were raised as children so we're all we're all cautious as parents um but we we do our best like like most parents thank you yeah um now let's go back to Rafaela. Rafaela, you had another question Yes, um, I wanted to ask if you felt empowered writing your book and telling the story of many Vietnamese families and did this process of writing this book help you in a way empower this community and advocate for it politically? Yes, but it took a little bit of time. Um, you know, first I had to get it out of me and that's a very lonely process actually. You have to like shut yourself in and not talk to other people after you're done with your research to make a thing. And that was really hard for me because I am an extrovert and I, I really like talking to people. Um, and it was a scary process because I didn't know if I could really execute all of my ideas. Um, but I just decided, well, you know, I'm just gonna do the best that I can. That's my built-in disclaimer. Um, and the surprising thing was that once I finished it, and it really was a book for me that I needed to see in the world and didn't, so I had to make it myself. The surprising thing was once I started to get to share it with other people, how many people were waiting for a story like that too and could relate to it, even though it was technically a story about my own family. So it's been really cool to get to travel with this book and talk to so many people. Um, and um, I really love it when I meet people from outside of Vietnam, like from Ecuador, for, for, from Rwanda, or you know, um, people who've had some sort of migration experience or even just like friction with their, their parents because of this generational rift. Um, I really enjoy talking about our similarities um, and learning about other people, because that gets me back to what I really love, which is talking to other people. So it's been a wonderful vehicle, actually, for reconnecting with the world. And then as far as empowering myself to empower my community, yes, in a way. Um, you know, when I was younger, um, I felt like I had to distance myself from my community in order to go into the arts, because it wasn't really a supported thing. I still remember, like, 
the face of my dentist who's Vietnamese while he was like working on my teeth he asked me what I was going to study in college and I said art and he like <laughs> he almost like spit out his mask onto me because it was just such a ridiculous thing um so I you know I went into art and there really weren't any other Vietnamese people for a long time um so I was kind of like an astronaut in outer space but then when I landed back on earth with my book it was like my astronaut gift to the community and it proved to be a more useful one than um than I thought it could be thanks now these are very fraught times as we all know um and Dr. D asks online, what are the lessons that you've learned as an activist writer, particularly in light of these struggles today and the racial unrest that has beset our country once again? Um, find your friends and don't, don't organize alone. Well, you can't organize alone. You can be mad alone. You can be cynical or depressed alone. You can probably also be angry alone, but it, it's not gonna go, it doesn't end well. <laughs> um, in order to do something about it, you have to find other people who are also willing to stand up and, and shake things up and who have resources that are different from your own. Um, if I only hung out with other cartoonists, maybe we would tell stories about what's going on, but I don't think I would have any impact on policy or I wouldn't learn anything new about how to impact policy. Um, so I, I, I sought out situations where I could um, collaborate with um, doctors, lawyers, um, elected politicians, um, formerly incarcerated people, movement leaders, um, as many, people as I can learn from, um, really. And if the world is ending, there's no place I'd rather be than with the people who are trying to do something about it. So that's how I don't get into that existential paralysis that I think many of us have felt this year, especially. Um, it's not about trying to, it's not, it's not about like putting on a happy face. It's actually about facing the reality of what's wrong, but believing that if enough people try, this ship can be turned and, and finding out who, who you can work with to, to pitch into that effort. Thanks. Uh, we have another question uh, from online. This is from Runju Martin Lee. Um, and it prompts another follow-up question that I'll ask at the end of his. Do you think there's a cultural gap between American-born Asians and international students from Asian countries? If so, what are some of those key differences? And would you offer any tips to help eliminate stereotypes and bridge those cultural gaps? Um, and my follow-up is, um, do you call yourself Asian American? And if so, at what point in your life story did you start to do so? Mm, okay, I'll start with that one because it's a little bit easier to answer yeah. and then I'll go into the other one. Yeah, Asian American, um, we were talking earlier in, in, in the group about at, uh, student organizing. You know, the, the, the term Asian American came out of student organizing in the late 60s. And that is an incredible gift um, because before that there were people who came from different Asian countries that all had like bad blood with each other, by the way, who had diff very different identities and who were all very, very tiny minorities in the US, but who were all treated kind of the same in the US. Um, like everybody from Asia, Asia has been called a chink at some point in their, in, in their American experience. So that's what we share. But um, instead of like just wearing that negative, we can turn it around and organize our, put ourselves politically under this name, Asian American. Um, so that's a term that I use because I'm aware of electoral politics and, and, and the importance of representation, um, not just in like politics, but in like say healthcare or the census, like it's important to like know who, who, who needs help and what kind. Um, as far as uh, 
if there's a difference between American born Asians and Asian born Asians, I think there's a difference between American born anybody and, <laughs> and the rest of the world, just because of our like position, America's position in the world, right? Like America is very self-centered. Like it is very possible to go through school with knowing very little about the rest of the world because the rest of the world in many ways revolves around us. And so I think that kind of um, pass to be ignorant about the rest of the world is something that many American born um, folks share no matter what their ethnic background. And that's something that I try to work against. So international students um, like, wow, you, you are the messenger that the rest of the world exists <laughs> and is different from what we know of it as Americans. Um, culturally, I mean, I suppose like one could make some generalizations, but I don't really want to do that tonight. Um, but there are, of course, like cultural differences in the way we, we perceive like the, in, the, the importance of the individual versus the family or the individual versus like society as a whole. And maybe that kind of um, cultural difference might show up in interesting behaviors, like whether or not we wear masks. We, we have a, another partially related question coming in. Who were your artistic influences and were any of those Vietnamese artists? Um, let's see. I have so many. Um, I'm actually a terrible reader. Um, I, I don't read as much as I should. I, I get a lot of my influences from um, movies, TV, music, um, comics, um, and, and books. Um, somebody that I was watching, a lecture I watched uh, just an hour ago for inspiration. It's a, it's a lecture, it's a favorite one of mine that I come to uh, every once in a while. Um, it's the, the, the Danger of the Single Story by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Gadichi. Um, and it's such a universal thing that she's talking about uh, um, that I really relate to as a writer. And it's, it grounds me in my purpose as a writer to subvert the, any kind of notion of a single story about a a group of people. She says the danger is that when you tell the same story about the same people over and over again, it solidifies and it turns them into that and um, creates a stereotype that is inaccurate and incomplete and helps us dehumanize that group of people, whether it's putting them on a pedestal or scapegoating them for the worst things. Um, the single story is something that as a storyteller, I have to remember to push against. Um, artistically, comics, um, if there are comics people in the audience, um, GP, uh, an Italian comic artist is one of my favorites. A, a story, an American storyteller that I love is um, uh, Craig Thompson was one of my very first mentors, the author of Blankets. Um, Trinidad Escobar one of, is one of my first students when I started teaching graduate students. And she's become one of my favorite artists as well. So I take my inspiration from everywhere. We have a great follow-up question from a colleague, a librarian colleague of mine, Alexandra Gallen Parisi, who asks, your book turned me on to the entire genre of graphic memoirs. Thank you. I've been reading graphic memoirs by women, trans, non-binary, BIPOC authors. Are there any specific ones that you would recommend? And it better be good because she's a librarian. Yeah, yeah, let's see. Um, we'll definitely look up Trinidad Escobar. Um, she has part of her memoir published, it's called Crushed. Um, there's another one called um, Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe, also one of my former students. Um, there's some really incredible talent coming out of the CCA program. Um, let me think. Uh, behind me, I was their American Dream. Um, by I'm going to say her name wrong, Malaka Garib, who's Filipino and Egyptian. Um, and we're talking about graphic memoirs, correct? Correct. Yes. Um, Tom Hart wrote a heartbreaking uh, memoir about the death of his first daughter named Rosalie Lightning. Um, be prepared to weep and weep and weep 
uh, if you read that one. Um, well, I should have a list on my written on the palm of my hand because there are so many, but I'm blanking right now because I'm not sitting next to my bookshelf. Um, is there any way for me to share a list later? I think we could post one onto the Trinity Facebook. Okay, great. I will send you so one, that. and then that'll be good because then people will have links. Well, it's it's about as fair as asking a literature professor what his favorite novel. It's or so book. hard, right? How do yeah. you come up with just one? Yeah. Um, well, we're going to turn things back over to a student, to Joseph. But first, I'm sure many in our audience are wondering, what are they looking at behind you? Could you share what, what you shared with students earlier? Oh, sure, sure. This is, um, these are my homegirls. Um, <laughs> this is, this is a tribute that I drew of um, a group of Vietnamese American women that I met three, three and a half years ago, who have become some of my closest friends. I'm in daily contact with them. They are political activists, um, as well as mothers and wives and friends and um we hold each other up when things get rough. And I think everybody should have, have a, a group like that to support them. Um, I drew a cover for a magazine called The Believer a few years ago. And because they gave me free license, I asked, can I draw some crazy Vietnamese women? And they said, yeah. So um, this is my tribute to them. And I like to have them behind me whenever I speak. Well, that seems fitting. So let's turn things back over to Joseph. Joseph, you had another question? Yes. So in your experience as an artist, um, what role can uh, you and other artists play in, through your comics and through your uh, other works of uh, illustration in dispelling certain stereotypes that have often in the past been displayed through art? Yeah, it's an interesting question because if you look back in history, so many times political cartoons have been used to disparage different groups, right? Um, so yeah, how do you take a medium that has been used to, to, to caricature, caricaturize people and, and use it to tell truth? Um, I think you have to be ethical. Um, I think you have to avoid the, the, low, the, the low blows and, and the cheap shots. Um, it's easy to to draw somebody and make and villainize them, but it's harder to figure out what's wrong with the story that's being told right now about a situation or about a people, and find what's missing and create it. And I think that's the the, the most pure idea of what an artist is that I've heard. Like an artist looks and sees what's missing and then figures out a way to make it. Um, and as a storyteller, what you're doing is you're tapping into this like very human need to understand things through stories. People need things narrated to them because the news cycle moves very quickly and is motivated by things other than our own understanding. So people need storytellers to help them keep the plot in their head about something that's happening if they're ever gonna do anything about it. Like, you could miss the forest for the trees if you just follow the news cycle. So we need storytellers to help us remember the arc of, of, of a movement, of an effort to change things for the better um, so that we can decide our place in that story as well. If that makes sense. I was planning on saving this online question for a little bit later, but it seems to fit as a natural follow-up. So let me ask Stephanie Velasquez's question. Hi, Stephanie. Are there any other projects, creative or otherwise, on the horizon? And I think that ties in with your previous answer. There are so many. <laughs> um, I always have a million projects and I'm, I'm like notorious for saying no, but somehow I still end up with a lot of projects. Um, the big one that I'm working on is my second big book. Uh, it's going to be a work of graphic nonfiction again, um, and it's called Nowhere Land, all one word, all caps. Um, and it started with uh, telling the story of some uh, Vietnamese folks and other and Southeast Asian folks who had uh, 
been detained by ICE in the US and were in danger of deportation. As I did more research, um, it expanded into a book that was also about the prison system, incarceration in America, um, and, and border camps and refugee camps in other countries filled with people who are waiting to resettle in places like the US. So it's about like all of the liminal spaces that are like literal physical spaces that exist all over America and all over the world where people get stuffed when they don't fit into our conception of us. Um, it's my takedown of, of some systems that I think don't work here and elsewhere. Um, and I'm trying to tell it in very few words, lots of art, um, lots of personal stories, lots of um, people telling their own stories in their own words and me just listening, witnessing and trying my best to like narrate that story in a way that's understandable. And, you know, leaving in history, of course, because I love history and I think history helps us understand big stories. And also leaving in policy because I have that that legal studies brain too, so that we understand like what are the laws that have been created um, and who have been the major players in like creating this, this situation we have today. Um, some of the small projects on the side, uh, I've been working on, um, while I've been stuck at home, not able to travel to places, um, I've been working on a series of comics about the pandemic through the lens of inequity and that's been a collaboration with a news source called Reveal and um, a comics publisher called The Mib. Um, so the series is called Invulnerable and it's 15 different interviews done by 15 different reporters with real folks around the, world, around the US, um, all related to, to COVID-19. So everybody from um, a Black Lives Matter pro protester who's like risking you know, infection just to be out in the streets protesting um, and she's been protesting for years because her she lost her brother to police violence years ago. Um, everybody from that to an ER doctor to someone who lost their daughter to someone who is like a real estate broker in the Hamptons, um, renting out really fancy houses to people trying to escape from protests in the city. Um, and then there's my there's, then there's my political work, which uh, I don't always attach my name to, <laughs> but um, they're, they're, I'm cooking up some things. Um, last, last night I was helping Dub, a, a, Dub do a, edit a Vietnamese voiceover of Trump's interview on Axios, which was, which was a trip. You know, as you take on these really burning contemporary issues, is there any tension between that urgency of the now and the desire of, I think, all artists universally to want their work to live beyond their time? How do you resolve that tension? Is there a tension? I don't know. Like, I figure we all die, right? <laughs> it all ends at some point. And that this is, this is what you leave behind. Um, no, I don't think there's, there's no tension for me. Like, uh, I want to live well before I go. I want to be useful. Um, I take breaks, you know, I, the work sometimes, the, you know where the tension is, is between working and living. Because work is hard. And, and I don't know that living should always be hard. If you can get away with it, like, get 10 minutes in the sun, you know, kiss your loved one that kind of thing too. Um, that's where the tension is for me, it's finding the time for both. We have a couple of questions online uh, from Hannah Xu. Um, she writes, as a second generation Asian American, I really connected with several parts of the best we could do. Thank you for writing it and for helping pave the way for other Asian American graphic novelists and writers. And she asked specifically about your artistic choices in the book. Um, why did you choose the color scheme that you did? And can you describe your creative and writing process? How do you how do you decide when to focus on words versus the illustrations? Uh, like I said earlier today, that the 
the process of making the book was a hot mess because I didn't really know what I was doing and I was teaching myself how to do comics while I was making the book. Um, I wrote scripts because I was working with an editor and I needed feedback on the structure of the book. And so it's, it's a lot harder to edit, you know, things that are already drawn, it's pretty laborious. Um, so if you can send a script first to get feedback on like the conceptual structure of your book, like does telling the story backwards work? Yes or no, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I think because like it's, it's a lot faster to type and because like so much of our lives are built around words, the words came easier to be very honest than the, than the drawing did. And there's so many drawings that have to go into a comic book that um, that part can be pretty intensive. I still did have to edit things once once the book was drawn. Like I had, a, I had an earlier version of the book that was penciled very roughly, we call it thumbnails. Um, and it was about 80 pages too long, uh, which I didn't realize was gonna be a problem. So uh, I, I asked the editors, um, so is that page limit for real? They said, yeah. So I, I had a month um, to edit 20% of the book out. So I had to kill a lot of darlings and um, it was so hard that I actually like tricked myself into working at first by like using a pair of scissors and a glue stick. So I, guess I, I tricked myself by, th by thinking I was doing arts and crafts, like cutting things out. Um, and that was kind of fun for a little bit. And then I had to take it to Photoshop because it, it got out of hand. So I could resize things and like really compress pages down. But I think what happened was in the end, it got, it was a leaner and meaner story. You know, I think it was better for that editing process. So um, the process was pretty much like me teaching myself how to do really hard things and like getting very, very art buff as a result. Um, and that's now what I try to push myself to do with every new project, just embark on something really hard, learn what I have to learn in order to realize it um, and push myself hard so that I get really good at it. We have maybe time for a couple more questions. Let's go to an online question from Tracy Watts. Did you experience trauma from your refugee experience? And how did you cope with that, if so, as you emerged into adulthood? You know, I think that I was so small that any, that my experience of of the the transition was very I don't know it wasn't traumatic in, in in the sense that you might expect I was only three years old and when I look at a three-year-old now and like what they're aware of you know I'm like how, how could I have known what was going on right all I knew was how things felt I didn't even know like I didn't really understand full sentences at age three all I knew was how my parents felt and if they were conveying fear to me through their voices or through their actions, that's what I retained. And so I think what I was able to heal was that relationship was with my parents. I was able to understand with adult eyes um, what they were going through when they were acting weird. Um, for them, the trauma is something that has to be unpacked, I think, very differently. And I've, I've learned from talking to um, psychiatrists who work with current refugees now, um, different methods of talking through trauma. It's been really, really fascinating. One of the methods I've heard of that I think is really beautiful is storytelling, actually, telling one's own story in terms of events and actually literally creating a timeline of events. Maybe the difficult events are stones and maybe the, the beautiful or, or positive memories are flowers and you place flowers and stones on your timeline. And what this does for you is it helps you realize that these are specific moments in your life and that they're in the past and that that trauma doesn't have to be with you at all times. Cause that, that is the effect of trauma, right? You can't, you can't put it down, it stays with you always. Um, but if you can visualize it being this specific moment in your past, then maybe you can become free of it. Thanks. So we have time for one more question. I think I'm going to cheat a little bit and combine two questions into one. Good idea. Uh, we, we get this from Win Fan Kimai, 
who says thank you and who loves the best we could do. Can't wait for the next book. What advice would you have for students who would like to become artists and writers? And let me combine that with another question that's come in. Um, you participated with some Trinity student leaders this afternoon working on issues around organizing and just bringing positive change to our society. Um, what message would you have for them as well? Uh, thank you. Also, Nguyen Phan Kwe Mai is an amazing author. I'm so, I'm so honored that you're watching. Um, everyone should read The Mountain Sing by Nguyen Phan Kwe Mai um, to learn more about the famine in the North and uh, the land reform that I write about. And she writes about it in much greater detail. You'll, you'll learn so much. Um, you know, if you want to become a writer or an artist, uh, maybe also have a day job. I feel so bad saying that, but it's true. Um, we're not a country that financially supports our artists um, and it's a hard life. You're gonna to have to hustle for the rest of your life as an artist or a writer. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but yeah, double, double majoring is not a bad idea. Um, take care of yourself um, and you know, don't give up on your dreams but also have a practical side that pays the bills. Uh, that, that's real talk. Um, for activists, same thing, you know, like your dream is to, 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 to birth this better world and you also have to take care of yourself. So give yourself those breaks to, to renew yourself because your, wor your work will never be done is the reality. Um, so make sure that it's sustainable for you and find people to support you in your work so that, so that you can continue your work for as long as humanly possible. And thank you for doing the work. Tibui, we had originally hoped to have you join a jam-packed Lori Auditorium on the Trinity campus. We're sorry that we couldn't have you here on, in person but we are delighted that you've been able to join us and share so much of your spirit and your wisdom these last few days. Thank you once again. And I will be virtually clapping along with everyone else who's watching online. Treat. And it's different that I actually get to see more faces this way. It's been, it's been really fun. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>